Hey, so two things before uh, going back to, to looking at falling balls. One is I have posted the first of the problem sets. It's due a week from now, you know, 1 o'clock on next Wednesday. It's on a homework site that I maintain myself because Colab doesn't provide the, what's necessary to, to, to do a problem set like this. It's 16 questions. They're essentially all conceptual, um, multiple choice. Uh, hopefully, all of you will be able to, to, to get in. I, I register you, but, but it's under your computing ID. You, you just, I'm LAB3E. You should be able to put that in and get a password sent to you by email if you don't have it. If you're very new to the class, I may not have registered you. So I will try to remember to, to double check the registration and add people who are new uh, after class. What else? Uh, the, the site allows you to come, go in and come back and forth with the problem sets uh, questions. You can, you can pick them off one at a time if you like. Uh, you can look at them, print them, whatever you like, come back another day and, and work on them some more. And they're not pledged work. Don't get stuck and just like guess randomly. They're meant to help you learn. And so you're welcome to talk with friends about them, discuss, you know, argue over what answer you think is right. Talk to me about them. Um, my, office hours, that's what my office hours are for, before, after class also. Uh, ideally, you get a lot of them right, most of them right. You get two tries at each question. So if you get it wrong, OK, it gives you some feedback. And then you can go in and try it again for half the credit. Anything else? Um, once in a while, I mess up the settings. Hopefully, I got all the settings right. There are a lot of settings uh, to, to make them run smoothly. Uh, but it's supposed to be a learning experience. If you get too much help, as in, can you give me a list of the answers, uh, it's self-enforcing. Yeah, you'll get 100 on the problem set, but you'll get creamed on the exams, which are very, not, not dissimilar from the problem sets. The problem sets, I tend to have themes to them. So they, uh, this is all about uh, go over to the AFC and, and do exercises. Uh, this, is the, this is the physics of exercise. Um, in, the, in, the, in the exams, they're, they're, just, they're each one-off questions. There's, there's no theme to it. Any questions about problem set stuff? I, mean, I, I hung up some of you guys. That you weren't able to get in because I forgot to. It's a, basically a firewall problem. I forgot to open it to the whole world. I opened it to virginia.edu, but I had to open it more broadly because not all of you are at, at virginia.edu IP addresses. All right, the other thing to, to, to mention before I forget is the, the lecture slides. I, I post uh, condensed versions of them online. Uh, they're, they're on the schedule page, as, it, as it, in the, the electronic version of, of the syllabus piece over here on the right. If you go to that page, the videos are showing up after each class when, when the, I manage to get them through the, through the internet, right? Uh, but, the, but the lecture slides should be up there before every class. So for those of you who don't get value out of writing everything yourself, you, you can just print out the, the lecture slides and, and follow along, more or less. Sometimes I change them uh, last minute, and you'll see something on, on the view graph that isn't on the paper. But by and large, they're, they're similar. OK? Any, other, any questions about other logistical things related to the class? OK. Well, where I left off uh, was really in, in, in dealing with falling balls. What, 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 what's the story? It's a story of, of gravity. Uh, if you think back to skating, skating was the story of, of movement with essentially no forces, or at least unnamed forces. And things that are just left to themselves coast. Life is simple. They, they, follow, they move at constant velocity. And then gravity brings in a, a, a named force. Again, an object, because of gravity, an object develops a weight. Uh, just to, it's just language. So this ball has a weight. And in the absence of any other force, it falls. So that's what falling means. It means experiencing only its weight. That's the only force it experiences. And therefore, it accelerates downward. And as, as I tried to pass along to you all, everything accelerates downward the same. They all remarkably develop the same downward acceleration. It happens to be just under 10 meters per second squared. Uh, it's true even of you know, one demonstration. I, yeah, I, I won't. Do, everything falls like that, neglecting air resistance. And that means that once the ball's out of my hand, 
wherever it is, whatever it's doing, as long as it's here near the surface of the Earth, it's accelerating downward at 9.8 meters per second squared. On its way up, at the top, on its way down, the whole time, steady downward acceleration. On the way up, that means that its velocity, which is upward, is gradually shrinking, less and less upward velocity, because it's, it's accelerating downward while moving upward, that slows it down. On the way downward, because it's moving in the direction of its acceleration, it's speeding up. But the acceleration is the same the whole time, including at the very top. <sighs> Any questions or thoughts about all of this? Things that puzzle you? Um, hope I haven't dwelled at great length about the very top, but it's, it's, it, it, it's not a special moment except that the, the ball is momentarily not moving. Other than that, it's still accelerating downward, same as always. The one detail left, or, or, or situation left to uh, mention is when a ball is traveling in an arc. So if I throw a ball at an angle, or bigger angle, it travels in this, this special arc, and you're like, where did that come from? Well, the ball is, in effect, doing two things at once. And this comes about because Gravity is a purely vertical force. In fact, it defines vertical. What does it mean up and down? It's, it means toward the center of the Earth and away from the center of the Earth. Our up and down here is different from up and down in Europe, right? They, it, it, if we could simultaneously see all those people over there, they'd be at an angle like this, and you'd, like, you'd you know, it'd be a chuckle. We're, we're tilted, because vertical is different for them. OK, for us, OK, vertical is up and down. Um, I'm thinking of the, the, the book, Le Petit Prince, the, 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 the little kid who lives on a little planet. <laughs> They'd be probably all cockeyed. Anyway, sorry, I'm off on a tangent in my own mind. Um, happens way too often. All right, so, so up and down. Um, when it, the vertical motion of the ball, even when it's moving sideways to some extent, the vertical motion is the same as we just discussed. It's up and down. It's, it's accelerating straight down, so it, it loses upward aspect to its motion more and more until it comes to a stop momentarily, at least in the vertical part of its motion. And then it comes down faster and faster. So even though the ball is going at an angle, if you just forget the, the left-right part of its movement, or component of its movement, if you can just focus on the vertical part, the vertical part is that of a falling ball. Up, slower, 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 stop momentarily, and down faster and faster. The horizontal part didn't affect it. What about the horizontal part? The horizontal part of the motion, because it has no gravity, it has no, there's no force acting horizontally. Gravity is pure vertical. So the horizontal part of the motion is unaffected by anything. It's, it's that of a coasting object. So the ball is multitasking. It is falling vertically while coasting horizontally. If you just look at just its horizontal component of motion, it's just ticking off equal distances and equal times, like a coasting object should. So the result is, is that arc. The arc comes about because the vertical motion, it goes slower, 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 almost you know, stopped, faster, 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 faster. And at the same time, it's, it's moving steadily horizontally. And that describes an arc. It happens mathematically to come out as a parabola. Um, but that's the story. Any questions about that idea? So this will happen all the time in things that are, that, 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 that are essentially falling objects that are moving sideways. Uh, if you dive off a diving board, if you, go, if you dive purely straight up uh, off some springboard, of course, you're, you're likely to hit the board on the way down. Not a good idea. But, but, but your motion will be very simple. That's this motion, up and down. Okay? If you dive with some outward part, you will do up and down, but at the same time, you will coast steadily away from the board. All right. I'll, with that, I think I'm done with falling balls and falling stuff. All right? On to other things. Uh, incidentally, the problem set covers material through ramps, which is what I'm about to, to d discuss. And so I ought to be able to... My goal always in the problem sets is to get to all the material you need to answer the problems uh, at least by the day before they're due. Uh, I miss once in a while. It's just 
it is what it is. Uh, I know what I have to cover for this one, and I have to get as far as talking about energy, which we'll get to not today, but, but hopefully on uh, Friday, actually. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so story of ramps. Ramps, you know, secret preview. I'm going to bring in another force. Uh, we talked about gravity, but not everything falls, because sometimes things are held, are supported. They don't fall. And so we'll look at, look at why they don't fall. And leading into that is this question here, can a ball ever push downward on a horizontal table with a force greater than the ball's weight? There, you know, is there any situation, and you can, you can if I didn't outlaw it, it's allowed. Is there any situation in which this bowling ball pushes down on the table with a force that's greater than its weight? You okay with the question? How many think that yes, there are situations in which it can push downward harder than its weight? Okay, a few. A couple dozen. How about no? Okay, the majority are going in more enthusiastically too. They're a little less sheepish about it. They're, the majority are saying uh, no, it can't. It, the, the, the force it pushes down can never exceed its own weight. So we'll come back to that shortly. All right, that one, that one, we got a pretty good spread, but you know, it's more of a commitment than it is about dis distribution. It's sort of evenly distributed. Okay, some observations about ramps. First off, it's, it's difficult, you know, why a ramp? It's difficult to lift something really heavy, a wagon full of stuff, um, straight up, your new 80-inch flat screen. Too heavy to go straight up to your fourth floor uh, dorm room. Uh, it's easier to go up a ramp. So, of course, you order, you know, her, Hertz rent a ramp, and then you roll it up the ramp, and, get, and then you have to tear apart the window. But okay, something about the ramp is, making, is facilitating this, this lifting motion. Um, and it's, it seems like it's all free, but maybe not. There are some issues, like you got to go a long distance along that ramp. It's not a short ramp anymore. It's a long one to get, to get you easily up to the fourth floor. Uh, the, the amount of the push needed to push a, a, a wagon up a ramp depends not only on what's in the wagon, in, in, in fact, its weight, but also the steepness of the ramp. The steeper the ramp is, sort of the more like a, a ladder it is, the harder you have to push. So you can make a very shallow ramp, and it's easy to push even tremendously heavy things up it. We're neglecting friction, incidentally. Uh, so, so there's a sort of a trade-off, the steepness and, and the hard, how hard you have to push. And those are my observations. Right, all, all pretty familiar. Uh, so the questions to go after in looking at, at ramps, like put the baseball away, why doesn't a wagon fall through a table uh, or, or through a sidewalk? So right now my, my wagon here, this, this is the sidewalk, there's the wagon. The wagon has a weight. And we know if that were all we're experiencing, it would accelerate downward at just under 10 meters per second squared. But it's not. It's, it, it's, it's sitting there. And the weight hasn't vanished. But the, in reality, it's experiencing a second force. And as I said way at the beginning, forces cause accelerations. But it's not individual forces. It's the sum of all the forces. And in this case, there are two. And they sum to zero. Uh, one of them's down, one of them's up. And when you sum two forces, remember forces have direction, they're vectors. When you sum these two, they happen to add up to zero. And the result is it's an inertial wagon, meaning it's experiencing zero net force and it's not accelerating. It's following Newton's first law of motion, an object that it moves at constant velocity, zero. Is that okay, followable? All right, where did that second force come from? So I can guess I can flip ahead to this. The second force is, it's got various names. My preferred name is, a, I call it a support force, because it kind of makes sense. Uh, not all support forces are vertical, though. I should be, you know, it's a little bit iffy. The other names you may have encountered it under are contact forces and normal forces, where normal is a mathematical term. Um, what, it, what it is, is, is 
that wagon, which is trying to fall, gravity would lo love to have it fall, the gravity, the, the, the wagon, if it were to fall, would begin to, to dig into the, to the sidewalk. They would be, the wheels and the sidewalk would, would begin to overlap in space. And one of these things that nature kind of abhors, you know, it abhors a vacuum, and it, it hates having two things occupy the same space at the same time. The ultimate re reason for this the, the overlapping being a, being a problem is electromagnetic in, in origin. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with electricity and magnetism and all that stuff. But you, but you, you surely know that the material is made up of atoms, and atoms have things inside that, are, that carry what's known as electric charge, which is in our, our future for this class. And if you start shoving all these little parts on top of each other, the net result is repulsion. They hate it. And so the wagon wheels and the sidewalk act to not occupy the same space. So, so, the, so the, the table pushes, the, the uh, sidewalk pushes straight up on the wagon. Support forces act exactly away from surfaces perpendicular surfaces. Hopefully you, you have some sense of what perpendicular is. Uh, perpendicular is, is, is the ultimate of right angles. So if, if, uh, if a surface is horizontal, that's perpendicular to the surface. If the surface is vertical like this, that's perpendicular to the surface. This is, it's, it's at right angles in every respect. So what, what it is, 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 in this case, my laser pointer in the book, are, are trying to avoid overlapping. And the most direct way in which they can, they can do that is by pushing apart perpendicular to one another. Pushing along the surface like this. Those for, that's not the support forces. That, that will come to, that's friction. It's a different, it's a different kind of force. Um, support force is the overlap problem. Friction is the sliding across problem. All right? So because the sidewalk in this case is exactly horizontal, the, the Support force it exerts on the wagon wheels is exactly vertical, perpendicular to horizontal. Okay? Um, anything else I want to say about it? Uh, it, it we, we observe that that support force from the sidewalk on the wagon exactly cancels the wagon's weight. We know that because it's not accelerating. All right? Uh, I make sure it's not accelerating is different from saying it's not moving. When I get it coasting, like, like a skater, th during that coasting period between now and now, the wagon was moving horizontally, but it was not accelerating. And then once again, the two forces acting on it, it's weight down and the support force from the table, sidewalk up. Sum to zero. So why, why am I dwelling on this? Is it's easy to look at something and say, it's, we know that the force on it is zero because it's not moving. That's, a, that, that's not the right observation. That's a boom observation. We know that the, the force is on it sum to zero because it's not accelerating. Okay, you got the distinction? Not moving and not accelerating are different observations. Not moving says its velocity is zero. Not accelerating says its acceleration is zero. And that's, forces cause accelerations. There's no acceleration, there's no, no net force. You okay with that? Or questions about that one? All right, so it's not accelerating, no net force. How in the world did the table figure out to push the right amount? And it turns out that it's the result of a, of a negotiation. Uh, you kind of take it for granted. You put something down, a five pound block, five kilogram block, it's heavier, it's like what, 11 pounds. You put it there and it's perfectly supported, wow! How did the table, sidewalk, figure out to push just right? Well, because there, there was a brief period, so brief and so subtle you couldn't see it, when they were trying to figure it out. And I can make that period visible for you by going over to one of these, these spring scales, which is, it's, it's kind of like a sidewalk. It's a weird sidewalk. And if I put, the, put the, the, this guy on there, you know, it, 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 it's perfectly supported again. But the negotiation took a while, and you can see it. 
So watch, watch the negotiation. What this dial is going to tell you is how hard it is pushing up on the block. It is pushing up right now with a force of just under 50 newtons. This is an, it's, an, it's, it's a metric scale. We, we made it such. Uh, so it's pretty much, it's, it's, a, it's exactly supporting the weight of this guy. But watch the negotiation. Right now it's not pushing up on anything. When I put it on there, negotiating, woo, it's trying to figure out how hard to push. And there are moments when it pushes too little, and during those moments, the block is under supported and accelerates downward. And pretty soon it's digging deep into the scale, and then the scale starts over supporting it. It pushes too hard, ah, you're coming down and crushing me, it pushes up harder. And this, so the block, is, the block and the scale are, are fighting it out, trying to figure out. It's a very interesting motion, which I won't go into. Uh, the other semester I did, but that negotiation is going, until finally they settle down at just right. Um, this all comes about because the scale dents, and it's, it dents by a, by a very visible amount. You can watch, if you watch a grocery store scale, go, you know, okay, go to the, your grocery store nearby and, and throw a big watermelon into the, into the pan and watch the thing bounce up and down, and if it breaks, don't, you know, I didn't tell you anything to do. Um, you, you'll see a bounce. They're negotiating. They're trying to figure out how hard to push. And it's, it's a very stable process in that if it, if it goes, if, 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 the, if, it put, if the scale pushes too hard, the watermelon uh, ultimately begins to, to rise and causes the scale to push less hard. And if the scale pushes too, too weakly, the watermelon ultimately descends and, and gets the scale to push harder. So it all, it all settles out nicely, and pretty soon you've got a perfect support. Questions about that, that the concept of the negotiation? I mean, these are some of the things that you take them for granted, and in, in an ordinary uh, physics course, they're often just swept completely under the rug, but they're it's really there. Um, in a sense, it, it brings up questions like, well, what happens when an immovable object encounters an irresistible force? Well, you have, you have picked two impossible, you know, physically unrealistic situation, uh, elements. You're, you, there is no such thing. Similarly, uh, the sidewalk. You know, what happens when you put a, a wagon on a completely undentable sidewalk, just absolutely rigid? Well, there is no such thing. Everything, sidewalks, diamonds, they all dent a little bit when you push on them. And they do the negotiation trick, not as, not as uh, visibly as the scale does, but, uh, but there, it's there. So when you put the wagon down on the, on the sidewalk, ooh, it's bouncing up and down. It settles out. OK? So the, uh, uh, to name the situation, because it may be useful to us in, in the future, when you're in a situation like this where all the forces on the object cancel to zero, net force zero, no acceleration. The object's at what we call equilibrium. Synonymous, or it's the same idea as, as zero net force. So the, so the wagon is at equilibrium here. During the negotiation, it wasn't at equilibrium. There were moments when it was, had a net force up, and in which case it accelerates upward. There were moments when it had a net force down, which case it accelerates downward. And it was working on it, trying to figure out just the right spot to be, to be at equilibrium, and it's, it's got there. It's arrived there. All right? That's what equilibrium is. Zero net force. All right. Uh, OK. Well, we have the sidewalk pushing up on the wagon. What about the wagon and the sidewalk? So this brings up a question here, which is, if you push on a friend, former friend, is there any case in which your friend will not push back on you? Okay, the question? Can you push on them without them pushing back on you? How many think yes? How many think no? Okay, <laughs> I can say try it, and then I'll get in awful trouble. If you want to try on your own time, do so, okay? I didn't tell you that either. Um, the answer is no. If you push on them, they have to push back. They can be sound asleep. They can be completely lost in their cell phone, they still will push back. It's unavoidable. Um, it's called Newton's Third Law, uh, or it's an example of Newton's Third Law. You know, it's the famous action-reaction 
which is used so vaguely in so many circumstances that it's, nah, you know, is it really Newton's third law anymore? I don't know. This is the real Newton's third law. The real Newton's third law says that if object A pushes on object B, so it's exerting a force on object B, object B will always exert a force back on object A. And the force that object B exerts on object A will be equal in amount to the force from A to B, but in the opposite direction. It will push back, react. Is that okay? Completely, you know, exceptionless. It always happens. And to illustrate this, okay, I'll, 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 I'll invite two people to come up here and try experiment with pushing on each other with scales. Can I get two volunteers? Two volunteers, I'll be more assertive here. Please. Victoria. And who else? And Kristen. Okay, thanks. So th here's the idea. I'm going to give each of them a spring scale and let them push. So, so for example, me, if, if I were to push on one of them with the spring scale, you would see how hard we're pushing. Why is it reading open? It's, it's tippy. So Kristen, <laughs> hi. You get, you get one scale. And you, and you can hold it so, that, so the face is visible. And you come, come on over here, Victoria, and hold the second. And, and if you tip them so that, that you can push on each other, we will be able to see how hard Kristen is pushing on Victoria and how hard Victoria is pushing on Kristen. And, and the, go the goal is to see, can you ever push with different amounts of force? Is there anything you guys can do? You can see the, see the values that, of the forces? Hopefully, there, so whenever Victoria exerts a, a 20 Newton force, Kristen can't not exert a 20 Newton force. It's just not, you just can't do it, right? It's, it's, I'm giving you a hopeless situation to torment you guys. Thanks, okay, I'll, 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 let, I'll let you stop. All right, well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll be the, the, the goofball that rides the card here. Um, can one of you, Kristen, st stick around for a sec? The card says, do not stand, and I stand anyway. Okay? So now you get to push on me, and the issue is, is there any way that you can push on me with a different force than I push on you? Even though I am going to accelerate, right? Off I go. Presumably they were exactly even. I'm going to come back. Ha ha ha. I'll get you. Woo! Okay? You held the needle, though. But yeah, the point is, oh, yeah, I'll try again. Exactly equal forces. Even though I was, I was moving toward Kristen, away from Kristen, I was accelerating during this, doesn't matter. The forces are always the equal opposite. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you very much. I'll stop tormenting you. Thanks, guys. I, I, hopefully, we'll invite you all to come do some of the demonstrations while I do this. I will do my best not to make them embarrassing. I mean, beyond them, they're. It's always awkward for people. It's not always awkward. Some people live for being essentially on stage, and therefore, uh, like, we, we've had some strange experiences over the years. Um, anyway, the point of this whole exercise here is that there is no way Kristen can push on Victoria and not have Victoria push equally hard in the opposite direction on Kristen. Every time. It does not matter whether somebody's moving or not. It doesn't matter whether somebody's accelerating or not. And these are situations in which you can, you can convince yourself that those two forces should not be equal. And the, the truth is I've had instructors teaching how things work elsewhere uh, say otherwise to me say that there are certain situations where they don't match, and it's a little, oh no, they always match, okay? It's, um, so as in, even instructors sometimes just don't believe that, believe that reality. You okay with the idea that, that you push on something, it pushes back equally hard? Uh, what that means in this circumstance is that the, uh, the sidewalk is exerting a force upward on the wagon that is equal to the wagon's weight. Uh, it's equal in amount to the wagon's weight. I have to use the language carefully. 
Equal in amount means we didn't specify direction. Uh, so it's equal in amount. It happens to be upward. Okay? We now, therefore, know how hard the wagon is exerting is pushing on the sidewalk. It's pushing back equally hard, because that's Newton's third law. If the, if the sidewalk pushes up on the wagon, the wagon can't help but push down on the sidewalk equally hard. And in this case, it's pushing downward with a force equal to its weight. And we know that. The, the, here's the whole logic of how we know that it's pushing down with a force equal to its weight. Because the force it's exerting on the sidewalk is not literally its weight. Its weight is a force exerted by gravity on it. And it's reaching, gravity reaches into all the atoms and molecules and pulls them down. The force that it's exerting on the sidewalk, the wagon is exerting on the sidewalk, is a support force. It's not gravity. It's a support force. And it happens to be equal to the, to the wagon's weight because, because the wagon's at equilibrium, meaning that it's perfectly supported by the sidewalk. So the sidewalk is pushing up just right to support it. Well, it's pushing back on the sidewalk. And if the sidewalk is exerting an upward force equal in amount to the wagon's weight, the wagon is exerting a downward force on the sidewalk equal in amount to the wagon's weight. All right? That's why the, the wagon is pushing just right, just equal to its weight. Can, can you see the distinction between the force of gravity on the wagon and the force of the wagon on the sidewalk? They're two different forces. They happen to be exactly the same amount and direction. This is, just, this is just a question I could have asked you while we're playing accelerating and rolling around games on the, on the carts. And there's just no way that two people can, cannot exert equal but opposite forces on one another. OK, having said this about Newton's third law, I want to bring up, I, I, I'll call it a mis misconception alert. And here's the, here's the potential misconception. If, if Kristen is pushing on Victoria, and Victoria is pushing on Kristen, if those two forces are equal and opposite, as they are required by Newton's third law, don't they sum to zero? And therefore, there's no forces anywhere. Everything sums to zero. Ah, nothing happens. That, this is a misconception. But, but hopefully, you can follow the, follow, I, I, I'll, I'll leave people's names out of it. If I push on the wagon, the wagon pushes back on me, and those two forces are equal in amount in opposite direction, don't, don't they sum to zero and cancel, and, no, and nothing happened? That's, OK? The, the, the resolution to that seeming problem is you don't sum those two forces because they're not on the same object. Remember, objects accelerate in response to the sum of forces on them. So if I push on the wagon, and of course the wagon does push on me, there's only one force in the wagon, my force on the wagon. The second force that I was just talking about was the wagon pushing on me, and that's my business. That affects me. It doesn't affect the wagon. So the only force of this Newton's third law pair that affects the wagon is my force on the wagon. It's unbalanced by anybody else, and the wagon accelerates. Oh, it's OK. <laughs> Sorry, wagon. I'll bring out later, not, not today. I have another one of those wagons, and it has never had wheels. It's always been a friction wagon, and I feel very sorry for it. And believe it or not, I've, I've thought of exchanging wheels with this guy, just to give it a chance. All right, anyhow, <laughs> that's my craziness. Not, it's, it's not too real, don't worry. I'm, I'm not likely to go uh, show up in a clown outfit next time. Um, anyway, obviously it accelerated in response to my one and only force on it. The other force in the pair was on me, and that, in principle, would cause me to accelerate, but in fact, I've got so many other forces on me you didn't notice. You, you, you okay? You understand how Newton's third law pairs never cancel because they never act on the same object, and you never, it's never appropriate to sum them. OK. Yes, Fiona. OK, okay. So, 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 so Fiona's question is, is, if I push on it and it accelerates, how come 
it doesn't push on me and I accelerate. And the answer is that I was standing on the ground with all kinds of friction acting on me. Oh, don't put the weight in me. OK. I'm giving it now enough mass that it's going to be hard to make it accelerate. And it will push reasonably hard back on me. I'm going to hold the string to save this guy, because if it goes off this table, we're all going to chuckle. I mean, yeah. OK, so I'm going to give it a push. I should, I should give it a harder push. This is really reckless. Here we go. All right. Ah! Whoa! <laughs> Note to self. Don't do that one again. <laughs> I neglected the real hazard in this. It wasn't any of stuff up there. It was when on wheelie carts, don't do stupid things. OK. Anyhow, <laughs> the human animation version of that, which is a lot safer, involves, involves I give this a hard push. Whoa, it, it is accelerating away from me. And I'm accelerating away from it. Ah, stop me, stop me. OK. Is, is, that, is that OK? Um, this, incidentally, just to, to, to let you know that it's important, this thing, in general, as I do this in the other semester, is this is how rockets work. Rockets start basically like, like this. The ro I, I'm the rocket. That's all the fuel the rocket contains. And the rocket pushes the fuel in one direction. Off goes this plume of fuel. And the fuel pushes back. And the rocket accelerates the other way. That's how, so that's how rockets work. OK? Other questions? All right. So this comes back to the, the introductory question. Get this crazy hazard out of the way before I hit it a second time out of whatever. Can a ball ever push downward on a horizontal table with a force greater than that ball's weight? Remember the question? And I told you in, give, in asking the question initially, that if I didn't outlaw it in the question, it's allowed. So, so the situation is, is very weakly defined. Ball, table, can the, ta can the ball push harder than its weight on the table? You OK with the question? How many think yes? How many think no? Still a majority going for no. So can somebody who voted for yes suggest a way in which it might be possible for that ball to push downward on the table with a force greater than its weight. Samantha. Ah, so, so, so Samantha's observation is that if I push on the ball, then of course the ball is going to exert a force not only equal to its weight for, uh, because of the supporting process, but also my add, addition. So, so that's, that is true. It wasn't the version that I had in mind. I, and I should edit this, but it's, no, it's good. It's, it's good. So let me, let, me, let me edit the question. Should have done it long ago, because this comes up. Can it ever push harder on the table than its own weight with no one else touching it, nothing touching it? If it falls on the table. Ready? How hard do you think it pushed on the table during that impact? Really hard. Thanks. Yeah, this is exactly right. Um, there was a moment in there where it was pushing down with probably thousands of pounds of force. Huge. The, 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 these are often called impact forces when something hits something. The physics of that's pretty, well, is, it very, is important and, and, and not, very, not very complicated. When I dropped the ball, it was briefly experiencing only its weight, so it accelerates downward faster. It's going faster and faster and faster downward. And then it comes to the table. And the two are looking at each other going like, you're coming here? Bad news, OK? So the two begin to overlap in space. And they begin the negotiation process, trying to figure out. The table says, I'm going to support you. But, but we have to figure out how hard to push. Well, during that early part of the negotiation, the ball is moving downward quite fast. And the table has to, has to bring it to a stop and get it to equilibrium. So, but, but it initially doesn't push hard on the ball. The ball's moving downward fast. The ball goes deep into the table during its first, uh, when it first encounters the table. It goes deep into the table, dents it hard, dents it deep, and causes the table to push ferociously back on the ball. So it's, it's this negotiation process 
It's, it, there, there's a gentle version. If I dropped it from here, the negotiation would be horrendous. It would involve tremendous upward and downward forces. Briefly, it would break the scale, of course, so I'm not going to do it. But it's, it's that negotiation going on. The early stages of it can involve huge upward forces from the table on the, on the ball. Is that OK? Uh, to put this in a con you know, con other context that you would, would encounter, Gravity was actually a, a, an unimportant player in the story, except to get the ball moving fast. The same thing happens. I'm not going to throw a baseball at the wall, but, but, but when the ball hit, hit, hit the wall, that same process is going on. There's no, st there's no equilibrium to go to. The ball just never wants to remain in contact with the wall at all. But there is a brief period in which the two are trying to overlap, or, or you know, they're, they're, they're starting to overlap and they push apart ferociously by way of support forces, and the ball therefore slows to a stop, it's accelerating backwards, it then continues its outward acceleration and, and leaves. Um, but there, were, there was a moment when the force was quite large, and it depends on how fast I throw it and how hard the ball is and the wall are. But this is how a hammer works. So, so a point is that gravity wasn't important in the story because that was horizontal. I could, do it, I could do the bounce off the ceiling. Again, gravity is not important. Uh, it's not irrelevant, but it's not, it's not the big players. The big players are the two things hitting each other and trying not to overlap, therefore pushing apart. And a hammer works this way. You take a nail and you smack it with a hammer. You get the hammer moving. This, the nail and the hammer act to not overlap in space. And how do they do that? They push apart hard, equal forces in opposite directions. The force of the nail and the hammer slows the, the hammer to a stop very quickly. That's a big acceleration and requires a big force. The hammer pushes back on the nail, equally hard in the opposite direction. It's Newton's third law. And that tremendous force now in the direction the hammer used to be moving punches the nail right into the wall, pushes it right, right into, the, uh, into the wood against the forces of friction and stuff. Is that OK? So that's a, you know, how hammers work. I mean, there are thousands of examples of these collision effects. So in answer to this question then, yeah, sure, the ball can push harder on the table than its own weight. Just have the ball moving when it encounters the table, moving into the table, toward the table. And then when it hits, it will push really hard on the table, and the table will push really hard on it, and they will eventually get, a, get out of each other's way. Uh, if, of course, it's going too hard, too fast, it will break the table. So there's sort of a peak. There's a maximum to how hard they can push apart beyond which they begin to break. OK? Another part. This is probably a good, way, good place to, to end at. Can a table ever push upward on a water balloon with a force greater than the balloon's weight? We already see, see. How many think yes? How many think no? OK, the, voters, the voting is, uh, is midterm. Um, not even. It, the general agreement that, that yes, it can push upward, that the b table can push upward on the, on the water balloon with a force greater than its own weight. So, so here's a water balloon minding its own business. The force upward on the water balloon right now is equal in amount to the balloon's weight. We know that because it's not accelerating. But if I drop the water balloon on the table, so it's going downward, the table's going to push upward on it very hard to stop it. That, upward put, that big upward push is going to cause the balloon to accelerate upward. So it's not at equilibrium anymore. So the, force, the net force on it isn't going to be zero. It's going to be upward. It's going to be slow into a stop. And that net upward force, are you okay with the upward force being, being quite large when it hits? It's the same story I've been telling you belong, before. I'm, I'm bringing in maybe some new, some new ways of saying it, that it's not at equilibrium anymore. And if the balloon can tolerate that, I mean, the, the, it was okay for the, for the bowling ball. Is it okay for the balloon? Not so much. So here we go. All right, so I didn't break the balloon. The table did it. The balloon was, was heading down quite fast. The table decided, you're not coming here, man. I'm going I'm to push up hard on you. It pushed up hard enough to break the skin of the balloon and pop it. To, 
cause upward acceleration. All right? With that, we'll call it a day. On Friday, we'll come back, and we'll start tilting the sidewalk into a ramp. <laughs>